All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, for joining us here. So what we're going to try to do in the next 20, maybe 30 minutes is cover sort of the introduction to behavioral finance. So that's study session three on the CFA level three exam. And then from that high level understanding of what the study session is, we'll spend the bulk of the time drilling in on the first reading, reading five. And um, as you'll see, I think our goal here is to not only introduce the concepts, but give you a little bit of background about how things are tested, how they've appeared in the past, and also how they tie into the rest of the curriculum. So just a little bit about Go Study. Um, that's really what we're about, right, is, is giving you what you need to know to pass the test, um, pointing out areas in the curriculum that we think are fairly safe to ignore or at least more in the weeds. Uh, and we do that through a number of paid products, but also a number of free products. So we have a free mobile app, uh, which you can find in Android and iOS, 900 plus cards for level three. We've got full guided notes. We've got cram guides, equation sheets, slides and webinars, et cetera, you name it. Um, that said, right, a lot of what we do is try to help candidates. And, you know, if you get a lot of value out of it and, and you give us money for some of the, the paid material, you know, we love that, obviously. But... Um, that's not sort of what drives us at, at the core. And so at the end of the day, we give away a ton of shit in our free newsletter. Uh, so you can sign up by clicking that big blue button in this deck um, or just going to go study.io and you'll see it there. Free newsletter. We won't spam you. We give away tons of chapters of our material, everything we know about testing strategies, prep, etc. cetera. Um, so highly encourage that. You can always unsubscribe if we're not giving you enough value. Okay, so behavioral finance, right? So it's incredibly important um, for the level three exam. And, and the reason that's true is because L3 is all about adopting a portfolio manager framework. And so everything we've learned to this point has been centered on theory. What are efficient markets? What should people do? And the reality is people are different. They don't subscribe to economic theory all the time. Uh, and so as portfolio managers, we need to understand the reality of people's situations and drill down into that and decide how we can still do a good job acknowledging that there are things in theory that drive us towards optimal asset allocation. So the study session itself is built on three core readings. So reading five takes sort of traditional finance, breaks it down into its building blocks on both a market level and an individual level, and then offers alternatives based on behavioral finance, so like the realities of what we see and the implications of that. Reading six drills down into the specific biases that individuals um, sort of are guilty of on an emotional level, on a cognitive level, and then sort of the implications of each of those biases for what they do in terms of their portfolios. And then reading seven starts to transition to sort of bucketing investors based on those biases, trying to understand what they might need in terms of education, uh, in terms of how we interact with them as managers, and then also the degree to which we can educate them out of those biases or need to accommodate them which is a function of not only what type of behavioral biases they're showing, but also the degree of risk that deviating from optimal presents based on their standard of living risk. So high level, right? I think we touched on this a little bit, but worth reiterating. Uh, behavioral finance takes those efficient theories and acknowledges that people aren't robots. And so you have to have a really unique understanding of who these people are what they're about, their level of financial knowledge, in order to uh, treat them as individuals and build sort of an asset allocation strategy for them that's grounded in theory and what's efficient and what they should be doing, but also acknowledges that uh, maybe we need to accommodate those to build something that they can actually stick with over time. So on the exam, uh, it's no joke, right? Behavioral finance is weighted at around 10% of the exam on its own, uh, which makes it incredibly important. But even more than that, it's layered into a lot of what we're doing and talking about. And that's especially true with uh, the IPS or investment policy statement section. OK, 
Okay, sorry about that. Quick technical issue there. So um, behavioral, it's conceptual, right? This isn't a calculation heavy section. Uh, there are some equations presented and particularly with utility theory, but that's not what you're gonna get tested on. What you're gonna get tested on is um, lists. So what are the biases? What do they mean? How do we mitigate them? And also sort of how it's layered into making smart asset allocation decisions. And so you need to be prepared not only to uh, nail sort of identification style questions, like here's a long passage about, say, an investor uh, describing their thought process, their financial realities, what behavioral finance quirks, et cetera, are they um, presenting, or how is their behavior deviating from optimal and what could explain that. Um, so here you have a, a sort of selection from past actual CFA morning exams. Um, I think, as you can see, from 07 to 15, behavioral finance shows up at least on one problem every exam, and so you need to be prepared. Good news is that the way those problems show up is fairly predictable, right? So you have those identified type questions based on a passage, or perhaps you need to describe um, how a behavioral theory modifies traditional assumptions um, and what that means in terms of behavior. So what we're going to do now is drill down into reading five. Um, so we're going to present sort of what traditional finance is, what it's built on, what assumptions it incorporates, and we're going to do that at a market level. And then we're going to talk about some of the market level behavioral finance challenges of that. Um, and then we're going to drill down into the building blocks. So um, traditional finance is built on individuals that are rational economic actors. So what does that mean for their decision-making process? What does that lead to? And then, okay, so maybe, again, we're quirky, we're people, right? <laughs> we're not robots, so and not all of us are making these, quote, utility-adjusted um, risk-maximizing, return-maximizing decisions. Um, so what types of modifications does behavioral finance show to that? And then we're going to kind of bleed in and give you foreshadowing for reading six and seven on um, categorizing the different biases people face, bucketing them into groups and talking about why that matters for uh, eventually in the next study session, creating an investment policy statement and guiding their asset allocation decisions. So reading five is all about defining what behavioral finance is in contrast to traditional finance. I think we've harped on that a lot. But traditional finance is really um, the theory. It's, it's about what should be done to achieve this, quote, sort of optimal outcome, this um, outcome that's reflective of all information, making risk-adjusted, return-maximizing decisions. Um, so it's, it's normative. It's what we should be doing. And traditional finance is built on three core assumptions, and we'll unpack all of these more as we go. But it's built on the assumptions that people are rational, people have perfect information, and markets have perfect information that they quickly absorb. And so, again, it's the theory, it's the optimal, it's modern portfolio theory uh, built on sort of traditional neoclassical uh, economic models. And the thing is, it's very useful. It offers us directional guidance, but it doesn't incorporate uh, what's actually happening and that's behavioral finance. So behavioral finance is really descriptive, right? It comes in and it says, okay, here are all these models about what people should be doing. Let's look at what they actually are doing. Um, and what they are doing shows that people are weird. They're not always rational. Uh, on top of that, you know, they're not always like mathematical geniuses. So when we look at information, we're not always making perfect decisions from it. We just can't. Um, and so that's behavioral sort of relaxing assumptions on the individual level. And then on this sort of more macro market level, um, you know, there's no such thing as perfect information. We don't know everything at all times, and we can't apply that knowledge at all times, and particularly not at the right time or within, you know, seconds of incorporating information. So as I mentioned, I think we're going to cover sort of the higher level, what efficient markets mean, what the theory or hypothesis of them is, uh, and then look at some of the assumptions behind that and the challenges to those assumptions. And from there, we'll go back to sort of 
the microeconomic decision-making frameworks that underline it. So what is an efficient market? Uh, it's pretty straightforward, right? An efficient market is one where prices accurately reflect information and all information, really. And not only that, prices automatically adjust as a function of market participant behavior on this perfect information. So those markets adjust instantaneously to any new information. Um, so if it's always priced correctly, because it has all the information, it incorporates it all the time, the implication is they can't really earn alpha, right? No um, positive risk-adjusted returns are possible in such a market. And the implications for portfolio managers is that your, your mandate isn't to beat the market, it's to look at other ways you can add value, whether that's um, through tax optimization or um, identifying what the optimal sort of risk levels are for an individual and putting your portfolio on that. So this is all familiar ground, right? This is what in level one and level two we've really been covering and building it on. Uh, and what efficient markets lead to this idea that there's no risk-adjusted returns um, that are possible, that are alpha above average, uh, it's represented by the CAPM model, right, which is essentially, um, should be anyway, very familiar to you at this point. And the CAPM is, is saying that there's a single efficient market um, and we basically craft our portfolio using expected returns of that market, the standard deviations and covariances of our portfolio to choose our risk level and build a portfolio on that security market line. So it's a little bit of a tangent, but um, CAPM is very, very tested, of course, in all levels, level three is no exception. So there's a couple things you probably should know about it. Um, right, one is sort of the key assumptions uh, we list them out here on this slide, but uh, what it boils down to is that CAPM assumes markets and market participants are efficient, and that means there's competition, prices adjust, everyone thinks the same about markets. Um, there's no friction, right? So you can diversify and make your decisions with no um, costs, including taxes. Um, and so obviously it's a simplification of what's going on, but a very useful one. And then on level three in particular, uh, you might see CAPM tested in a few ways, right? So first, you, you might be able to or need to look at sort of a graph of the CAPM and look at portfolios along of the graph or individual stocks and say, are they overvalued or are they undervalued? So overvalued stocks would fall under the CAPM. Um, and what's that saying? It's saying that they have a higher risk for a given expected return than is optimal. And so they're under diversified. They have too much um, sort of unsystematic risk. Uh, expected returns or sort of expected risk adjusted returns that fall above the cap and indicate undervalued stocks. Um, a couple other things that you'll see and we'll get into these of course, but um, you'll need to look at the behavioral asset pricing model, understand how it modifies the cap M model uh, and what that means and then cap M uh, also sort of appears as the base for sort of the international modification. Same equation, just a different expected market return or country-specific scenarios where you're adding a country-specific risk-adjusted premium to the equation. And then finally, uh, in corporate finance sections, calculating the weighted average cost of capital, things like that, um, CAPM certainly appears. All right, so that tangent aside, let's go back to this idea of efficient markets, right? So efficient markets, markets where all information automatically and instantaneously incorporated into prices, clearly not entirely a realistic de depiction of what's going on. Um, so there's three challenges to this, and those challenges are essentially based on the level of information that is available to market participants and incorporated in market prices as a result. So they move from essentially uh, less information incorporated into markets on the left here in this weak form uh, challenge all the way to all information sort of incorporated. Um, so the weak form um, hypothesis says that current market prices reflect all of our past price and volume data and information. And the implications of that are that 
charting techniques, technical analysis, and trading. You can't generate excess returns because all of that information is already incorporated into prices. But uh, as a result, fundamental analysis or sort of uncovering the new information, et cetera, um, may actually lead to alpha. So the semi-strong form is essentially the weak form, um, which is that all past price data and volume is reflected uh, in current market prices. Plus, it adds in the fact that um, all publicly known information about that security or company is already incorporated as well. Um, and so not only is technical analysis not possible or doesn't lead to alpha, but fundamental analysis also doesn't lead to the ability to earn excess returns. Result of semi-strong form, all information is included, all public information. Uh, but if you do have insider or material non-public information on a security, uh, it could possibly lead to alpha. And th this is generally thought to be true, right? If you have insider information, um, you have a chance to beat markets. And then the strong form builds on the semi-strong form, predictably, right, and says, okay, all information is incorporated in security prices, and that includes non-public information. As a result, you just can't earn alpha, right? Everything's already factored into the stock price. So these challenges, right, you're going to need to know them. Um, you might need to talk about their implications, what it means for portfolio managers' behavior, um, but it's also worth noting that sort of this efficient market hypothesis, which these are attacking, is generally thought to sort of hold true for the most part, uh, with some exceptions. So the exceptions or anomalies um, that get pointed out are uh, large cap stocks are generally thought to be more efficient than, than small cap um, or value investing leads to outperformance over uh, other forms of investing like growth, right? And so potentially a challenge certainly um, falls into sort of the weak form bucket there. But uh, some counters to that are, are simply stating that, uh, okay, well, they might show higher returns, but that's just reflecting that there are riskier strategies. Uh, we've also seen sort of calendar anomalies, so like the January effect where stocks tend to rise, um, which challenge this weak form hypothesis. And so uh, I think what you should take away from it is, um, in theory, right, you have the efficient market, you have challenges to it based on informational basises, and those three challenges, weak form, semi-strong form, strong form, you need to know them, you need to know this table, it's going to be tested. Um, so, you know, don't get caught by surprise. All right, so let's shift back to the micro. So we've got rational... Uh, efficient markets reflecting all prices. Why is that the case? Uh, what does it depend on? It depends on the idea that all sort of economic actors are uh, uh, perfectly rational. They're making um, risk-adjusted decisions that uh, make sense in terms of economic theory. And that means a few things. It means more stuff is better than less stuff in the eyes of these people. Um, less risk is better than more risk, all else equal, right? So investors are risk adverse. Investors also have perfect information. This is all the stuff we just talked about. Uh, and then on top of having perfect information, they're fucking geniuses. So every time we get new information, we're able to probability weight that information, perfectly apply it, and make decisions or adjustments based on all of that. So bottom line, a rational economic actor uh, perhaps you've seen REM as, as a tag. Uh, apologies to all the women listening, but um, you know some of these economic textbooks were written a while ago. But REM, rational economic actors, they try to obtain the highest possible utility given their budget constraints. So we've seen utility before, but let's really unpack it a bit here. So what is utility? Utility is just an economic term, which is describing how one measures their best possible outcome. Uh, official definition is the, quote, level of relative satisfaction received from the consumption of a good or service. So let's take sort of this graph that shows a utility curve or an indifference curve plotted against a budget constraint or efficient frontier. So what we're saying here is that we all face a choice between working and not working or having leisure. And so the the constraint of that is the 24 hours we have available in a day. 
And based on those 24 hours, we want to make a utility maximizing decision based on our personal preferences. Um, and so obviously, right, there's a trade-off. You need some money or hanging out isn't much fun. But if all you do is work, your money isn't going to be worth much to you either because you just have no time to use it. And that's a key concept, right? The more of leisure or work you have, the less valuable having a little bit more of that becomes. I have 20 hours of leisure a day, but I can't do anything. I can't pay my cable bills. I might want to work more. So that's the idea that utility has diminishing marginal returns. And diminishing marginal returns is responsible for the shape of that curve, right? The convexity that you're seeing there. Um, and what does it mean? In the end, we're going to choose some combination of work and leisure that works for us and maximizes our utility according to our preferences, and our constraints. So different people might have different utility curves. Uh, before we move on and sort of apply this to uh, wealth management and investing, um, in the curriculum there's a lot of time, well I wouldn't even say a lot, but there's time spent on the four assumptions of utility theory, completeness, transitivity, independence, continuity. Uh, I'm not going to go through them here. Uh, I don't think they'll be tested. We've never seen them tested as far as we know, certainly not in the morning sections that are publicly released. So no guarantees, but um, you know, feel free to skip that, I think. All right, so how does this idea of utility apply to investing? Um, before we had work and leisure depicted, you can also think about risk and reward trade-offs investing. Uh, what we're seeing here in this utility curve is, is two different um, trade-offs reflected depending on how wealthy a person is. So what it's showing is that the more wealth you have, the more risk averse you become, right? You have to have more of an expected return to offset any risk, right? We're already rich. We don't need more money. Uh, whereas when there's less wealth, we might be more risk um, tolerant and risk seeking because we want to get rich. And if we lose a little bit more to do that, okay, so be it. And this boils down to um, behavioral finance relaxing the assumptions of traditional finance that all risk investors are, or all investors are risk averse, or that they have this concave utility function, which is what you're seeing on the left here. And actually, different people might make different decisions. They have different utility functions or risk tolerances. Could be because they have different probability beliefs about outcomes, but also. Uh, we just might be different, right? So that concave shape, the traditional risk-averse investor's utility function on the left, that's showing diminishing marginal utility as our wealth increases. The risk-neutral investor in the middle um, really is acting as if they don't consider risk. They're only looking at returns. And then the risk-seeking individual has a convex utility curve here, which actually indicates increasing marginal utility for um, each additional unit of wealth. All right, so for the exam, know these shapes, know what they're saying about utility um, and, and sort of risk, and you should be good to go on the last like three or four slides that we covered. All right, so moving on. Uh, behavioral finance also acknowledges a couple key things in terms of how individuals behave in, in sort of reality and as we observe them. Um, and, and it's like this guy, right? Got two different colored socks on. <sighs> Life's hard sometimes, so he's like, fuck it. I'm going to put on some pants. I'm going to put my feet in some shoes. No one's even going to see these socks. It's good enough. So that's this idea of satisfice. Um, and satisfice is this concept that, like, we don't necessarily care about achieving the, quote, optimal or return maximizing scenario. We just want to get to something that's good enough. Um, and satisfice is also shaped by this idea of bounded rationality, which is this notion that uh, it's really impossible for everyone to have perfect information about every possible outcome for every single decision all the time, right? Um, so what it boils down to is that we as economic actors gather some information, but at some point we've got enough, or we can't possibly gather it all. Then we use rules of thumb, heuristics to sort of 
position ourselves, make our decisions. Um, and of course, even if we wanted to push the boundaries, there's limits to how, how smart we are. And so what we end up doing is practicing satisfice rather than sort of quote, a traditional utility maximizing decision. So this blends into prospect theory, which is a very core tenant uh, or introduction of something different that modifies traditional finance. So prospect theory is relaxing the assumption of utility maximization. And instead it's saying um, investors aren't looking at sort of absolute levels of wealth. They're actually looking at relative wealth. And um, one of the core tenets of that is that we face loss aversion. And loss aversion just means that we care much more, or at least more, about a loss of a dollar than the gain of a dollar. And that's like a well-studied psychological phenomenon. So we're constantly analyzing risk relative to possible gains and losses. And we care much more about relative changes to our wealth than absolute changes. And in particular, we want to avoid losses at all times. And when we have gains, um, you know, we're less likely to pursue sort of continual gains. We're more likely to lock them in to avoid losses because that's what we care about. And so that's what we're seeing in this graph, right? Like when we've already lost money, this bottom left quadrant, um, we're going to hold on to our investments because we want them to bounce back and avoid a loss. So it's a loss on paper. It's not a loss in reality yet. So we're not feeling that pain yet. So we hold on, we hold on, we hold on to avoid it. And that's a dangerous game to play, right? And then on the sort of gain sector in the top right, excuse me, um, we're doing the exact opposite. We've got gains. So if we sell now, we're going to avoid a loss for sure, right? So sell, sell, sell. And uh, again, that leads to us selling our winners too early often and, and doubling down on losers, which is not always a winning strategy in my financial markets. So quick recap, right? Uh, utility theory, all investors are risk averse. They have that concave um, utility function. They use probability weighting to make utility maximizing decisions subject to specific budgets and constraints. And then on the other side, prospect theory says that we're looking at relative values and changes more than sort of um, total ones. And we value gains and losses differently. And that leads to uh, very different behaviors depending on what's happening in the markets. All right. So what we've done now is cover quite a lot of ground, actually. We've looked at um, the macro in terms of what efficient markets are and then how, if we relax assumptions of perfect information, that changes our ability to earn alpha depending on different strategies. We've come back down from that level of thinking to looking at what rational economic actors are doing, uh, how they're making decisions, how they view risk, and sort of behavioral finance assumptions or frameworks that um, modify that to acknowledge that the way we actually look at gains and losses can be quite different than in, in sort of the traditional models. The rest of reading five is a bit more straightforward and it's going to introduce a few models um, around how um, people actually behave and how they might group their assets and what that means. Um, so for this section, you certainly need to know the theories and their implications. Um, they can be tested. You might be forced to identify some of these models based on investor behavior. Um, but looking ahead and sort of foreshadowing what you're really going to need to do for the exam, and certainly as a portfolio manager, um, you're going to need to look at someone's actual financial situations, look at how they're viewing their world in terms of their um, behavioral quirks, whether emotional or cognitive, and then working with them based on that understanding to design an asset allocation strategy and an investment policy statement that acknowledges their unique circumstances and constraints um, and builds a, a sensible model that they can stick with. So let's run through the different behavioral finance frameworks. Again, um, these are fairly straightforward. Definitely memorize them. Um, and then constantly be thinking about how that might apply to working with an individual. So the first model is the consumption and savings model. And this is essentially uh, articulating the idea that 
people feel differently about spending money versus saving it. So spending money today, like buying that ice cream, right, it triggers this immediate gratification. Yes, you've got ice cream. Whereas if I'm saving money, I put it in my bank account, maybe it's growing, that's cool, but like I'm not feeling that immediate benefit. So delaying gratification is a less powerful sort of psychological impulse. Um, and I think we probably all felt that, right? Like you probably like buying things, it makes you feel good. It's fun to spend money on something today rather than saving for some more abstract idea of like your retirement self and the future will benefit if you put money away today. It's like, cool, I know, but ooh, I could buy that car, whatever. So basically we have self-control bias around um, our income. And actually what ends up happening is that we frame our income and we put it into different buckets, right? So the three buckets in this model are current income, owned assets, and future savings. And so based on those buckets, we'll think about spending them differently. Um, and our marginal propensity to consume, NPC, is highest for our current income. If you studied economics, you've probably seen this before in micro. Uh, again, no calculations necessary here. Just know that we tend to spend more than we save, right? Um, and this is also related to behavioral life cycle theory, which is that depending on where we are in life, our stage of life, um, we might have different needs, we might think about our assets differently, um, and this is sort of part of this idea of mental accounting, which we'll get into later, but which is essentially where we place our wealth into different buckets in order to meet different goals. Um, and the idea here and why it's sort of in, inefficient in terms of traditional finance is that uh, it ignores the fungible nature of wealth. Um, and the fact that all wealth is your assets and can be deployed accordingly. And we'll see in reading six um, a few behavioral biases that feed into this consumptions and savings model, which includes framing, self-control bias, and, and sort of mental accounting, which we already got to. Uh, one thing just to note quickly, when we get to the investment policy statement and designing it and um, determining sort of an investor's risk tolerance in particular, their stage of life, part of this behavioral life cycle theory, is one of the key things we look at, like the timeline they have to invest. So that's the consumptions and savings model. I think that, that image sort of uh, encapsulates it pretty perfectly. So behavioral asset pricing model. We mentioned this when we looked at some of the key testable concepts of the CAPM model. Uh, but the behavioral asset pricing model is just saying that we're adding a sentiment premium to the efficient market or expected returns. And that sentiment premium is derived from a variety of forecasts from analysts. So it's kind of just acknowledging that like we have different viewpoints of information. Um, and as a result, we might model sort of that uh, expected return a bit differently. So you need to know the equation and you need to know that the more analysts dis disagree, the greater the dispersion of their predictions, the larger the sentiment premium and the higher the expected return. So fairly straightforward, know the equation, know that fact, you're good to go. So BPT, behavioral portfolio theory. So this ties a lot of what we've been talking about um, together, honestly. So this is a big one. Uh, and what you're seeing here in this triangle is this idea that we allocate as investors often different um, assets into different buckets, and those buckets depend on how much we actually need those assets. So to pay your rent, et cetera, you're probably not gonna put that into a really risky strategy because you need the money, and we'll put it in treasuries or something risk-free with high liquidity. And as we go up the sort of triangle from our needs to our wants, up the Maslow pyramid, if that helps. Um, we might be bucketing our assets and investing in higher expected return assets with more risk. And the way individual investors group these things will be very different. Uh, and those differences depend on the degree of importance they attach to specific things. So if um, home ownership is more important to, to me than you, I might invest in things with lower expected return to achieve it. Um, it also depends on my specific utility function and, of course, the degree of information I have about a given thing. So if I'm an art collector, right, looking at the top of that pyramid and I just have a ton of information on what's valuable, I'm very confident in that information, 
um, I might, you know, increase the concentration of assets and take on more risk because I have more information. So BPT is actually fairly effective from a portfolio perspective. It's not optimal, and we'll get into why, but it is effective. And the reason that's true is it can offer an understandable framework to individual investors about um, diversifying their assets. And that lets them stick to strategy through market highs and market lows. And it and allows them to avoid doing really, really stupid shit, shit that like will destroy your portfolio. Um, you know, if you had sold out at the bottom of the financial crisis in 08, you would have sold at the bottom, tanked your assets, not participated in the recovery. And BPT is a way that you could justify saying, okay, well, I have my asset allocation strategy based on my needs. Um, I'm just going to hold on. They're already bucketed in the right way. But it is suboptimal, and it's suboptimal because it doesn't consider the fact that all of these assets are correlated. So you dump a bunch of things in risk-free treasuries, you view that as one risk bucket. You're not taking a holistic portfolio approach to your um, to your assets. All right, so last one, um, we have adaptive market hypothesis, AMH. Um, and so AMH is sort of this idea that uh, certain strategies might work for a while, so you can use heuristics, rules of thumb, uh, and get away with that, and uh, it might work. But essentially, you have limited information um, and markets evolve, so at some point your strategies will also need to evolve. Um, and there's some implications for that, right? So um, first of all, risk and return changes over time as market participates, incorporate different strategies, etc. It also means that there are probably pockets of time and opportunity where um, the active management of your portfolio can actually generate alpha. Like this is a strategy that's working until markets evolve. So AMH is like uh, evolution and the theory of evolution at, at its best. Um, but it also acknowledges that eventually markets will evolve. Maybe your arbitrage opportunity will be competed away. No strategy works in all market conditions, so you better evolve or you're going to die, right? Um, so that's AMH. So let's take a step back. We're wrapping up here. Um, and so these are the, the sort of five modifications of traditional finance um, in terms of behavioral. You should definitely know them, their definitions, their implications. Um, but again, like foreshadowing, looking at what's ahead, you are going to see that um, these frameworks let us sort of have a better understanding of what markets are doing. Um, they'll also sort of bleed into, based on the individual behavioral biases that, that people are exhibiting, uh, we might be able to offer or understand some of the frameworks here that they might be using. And from there, we can either bucket them into different types of investors or adopt different strategies based on those buckets to uh, mitigate or accommodate their, their quirks and develop a, a good investment policy statement for them. All right, so whew, covered a lot, right? Um, here's the deal. There's a lot here. It ties into other parts of the reading. Reading six, even reading seven in some respects could be uh, a little bit more testable, um, but here you need to be able to draw sort of uh, contrast between behavioral finance and traditional finance, start understanding the implications on investor decision making as a result. Um, you'll certainly need to look at informational challenges to markets, the weak semi-strong form and strong form modifications of the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, utility theory, you need to understand it conceptually, understand how it leads to risk aversion, understand utility maximization subject to portfolio constraints or asset or resource constraints, uh, and then look at prospect theory and how the introduction of looking at relative gains and losses and the idea of loss aversion factors into investor behavior in the real world. Um, Satisfice, frequently tested kind of as a one-off, so understand this idea of bounded rationality, which is Again, um, information, perfect information, and the ability to act on it isn't always uh, isn't always there for us. And then, you know, we introduced a bunch of behavioral finance frameworks. Again, know the definitions, know their implications. Um, and this sort of slide, uh, it's a little screenshot from 
um, page of our CRAM guide, but uh, what you're looking at is some, some of the key testable concepts that we just went through. And really, if you understand the shape of those graphs in the middle of the page and what they mean in terms of risk aversion, utility maximization, this idea that people are different depending on who they are, or how wealthy they are, or what investments they're doing, uh, you're well on your way to then understanding how we can uh, deal with them as portfolio managers. So thank you very much for listening. I hope this was a helpful sort of run through of the reading. Um, covered a lot, went a little longer than I thought, but um, hopefully, again, helpful in terms of isolating key testable concepts. Um, one thing to note, we also look at uh, in our custom course on how to pass the morning section of the exam, um, commonly tested problems. So we'll look at all of those problems from 2007 through 2015. Um, look at the guideline answers, look at how some of your fellow candidates are actually answering them, and then how we grade those answers based on use of keywords, length, timing, etc. cetera. Um, so that's a separate recording that's available to our paying clients and, and people that are enrolled in that course. Uh, because, as you know, applying this knowledge in an exam situation, or, or hopefully as you know, uh, is difficult. And the morning exam in particular, because you need feedback on what you're doing, how you're saying it, um, whether you're using LOS command words, all of those things factor into to scoring well. Um, so we go over that at gostudy.io in our paid course. Um, again, lots of free material there, free newsletter where we share tons and tons of content, lots of tips and tricks, questions, etc. cetera. Um, so gostudy.io, um, our newsletter is, again, a free resource for you. You can also email us at help at gostudy.io if you have any questions. My name is Victor Sowers. I hope this has been helpful. We'll see you for reading six next time. Thank you.